Thanks, Jesper, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, can I just ask real quick, actually, just before we get started, can you give me like a tick in the chat if you are a scientist, like a literal, like academic, I'm doing science scientist, and across if you're just like anything else, like you're a product guy, you're a data science guy, you're, uh, you're building stuff, actually being useful, etc. I'd be curious. Okay. Quite a few of both. How are we looking, Jesper? I actually can't see it while I'm screen sharing. Oh, I'll open the chat. Okay, a lot of crosses. A lot of a crosses, lot of crosses yeah. Okay, so we're product people, right? Well, hopefully. And in that case, I'll frame myself a little differently. Um, so the aim for this talk was, until I asked that question, to kind of illustrate, I think, some issues that I've run into in my work trying to do um, science, science with machine learning and how that can be uniquely difficult. I think lots of the computer science research and the data science stuff we talk about focuses um, in academia, it focuses a lot on like benchmarks, you know, ImageNet, getting your paper in NeurIPS, um, in conferences like PyData, as I think this poll, you know, quick poll kind of shows, it tends to, to focus a lot on the, the commercial applications. I'm guessing many of you are like people at companies building things. Um, and a lot less so on the science. And so scientists often take the kind of advice aimed for computer scientists and product people and then fall into a few traps that that advice wasn't really designed around. Um, but since you guys aren't really scientists, um, I think I'll just change the words around a little and just kind of explain, I think, what's, what's different for scientists and maybe how some of these issues might also affect the kind of products you're building. Um, very quickly, who am I? Uh, my name is Mike Wormsley. I am a researcher at the University of Manchester. I'm an astronomer. Uh, I'm the lead data scientist for a project called Galaxy Zoo, which uses volunteers to classify in very large numbers, millions of galaxies. We have hundreds of thousands of volunteers contributing their effort to saying, oh, this galaxy is smooth, this one's featured, etc." cetera. Um, and it takes you down and asks different questions about those galaxies. And I'm ultimately trying to answer questions about how galaxies work. So for me, the model is a, is a means to an end of answering a science question. This talk is very much about getting to that end um, and the ways the model can go wrong. Um, I know that most people really aren't astronomers as well, but I think this can be quite common. So also for each kind of issue that comes up, I've tried to flag where this can also be a problem in the case of COVID. Um, very briefly, these are the issues that I want to talk about. And I've kind of arranged them loosely on a scale of, well, this is like a general ML problem that you really think would expect, um, affect everyone to this is really specific to the cultural context of science. And I'll just run through them quickly because it's a short talk and we're a little over time. So the first one is shortcut learning, which is essentially when the model works, but not in the way that you want it to. So as a quick example, uh, here's two pieces of astronomy data from a radio telescope called Chime. The aim of the model is to tell the difference between what signal is human junk, and that's just kind of one on the left, with what is a real signal from space, from these mysterious uh, extra galactic sources we don't understand. By eye, uh, I think the, the obvious thing that the, you would like the model to tell is, well, this is a vertical strip with some particular shape. Well, this is kind of junk. But actually, a very good way to tell the difference is simply saying, what is the standard deviation within this image? And you can be an almost perfect classifier between the two. So in that way, you can solve the problem, but not in the way that you actually want. And as scientists, we need to get that causal um, effect out because when we then try the model on new data, say it's fainter data, we need to make sure it still works. And I think that's important for product people too, because again, if your model is working for like a coincidental reason, um, that isn't going to generalize well to, to new data sets. Second one is train test leakage. So this is where you're where, you know, building kind of on, on Valerio's talk where you're careful to partition up your data set in, in interesting ways. The real world often doesn't fit this nice kind of row based idea of data. Um, so for example, here are four simulated galaxies from a real astronomy paper by uh, Cipriánovich, 2020, that's saying dividing galaxies into different classes. Um, but actually, they're not four different galaxies. They're four views of the same simulated galaxy. 
So if you do your train test split, your cross validation on this data, then you'll be mixing up different views of the same galaxy between your train and test sets. And your model can kind of cheat in that way. And this really happened in that paper, um, although it was fixed in, in follow-up work. And, and I really recommend, actually, if you're interested in deep learning in astronomy, then Ciprianovich's work here, and in general, is a really nice example of how to do it well. The third one is around what I call begging the question. And this is where your model will discover a bias, where, where you will see that your, your model's predictions depend on some feature. And you write it up in your paper, like, oh, yeah, this is the important thing. Or I guess in a product context, if you are, um, as a data scientist, trying to understand, like, what is driving your conversion rates, say, you find, oh, this thing is what's driving conversion rates. But actually, that's not what's really happening. What's happening is the, you're rediscovering the biases of your model. So to make that concrete, um, in astronomy, it's generally true that spiral galaxies are pretty blue and elliptical galaxies are pretty red. That means that the model can, can learn then just based on the color information that, okay, if this is blue and I don't know what it is, I'm going to call it a spiral. And then when you look through your predictions, you say, oh, look, the machine learning is finding all these blue spirals. Like spirals are super blue. Like kind of right, but also wrong because you've biased your classifier in the first place, right? And you're just rediscovering what your classifier has learned from your general population. Um, this is very tricky to fix, but it's mostly around controlling the information that you pass to the model. So for example, we might just pass a grayscale images here, or we might shuffle the channels around. Uh, the last issue I wanted to highlight was what I call sandcastles. And this is really a cultural thing. I think it's not a code problem. So in, in astronomy, we tend to make many, many uh, models for classifying galaxies. And in COVID, uh, there's a lovely review by Wynant where they found some 500 odd models um, produced for essentially diagnosis or prognosis of COVID. And it turns out that the vast majority of these were never validated independently. People were just throwing out hundreds of models. Um, the re and then they were useless, right? And it's largely considered a massive failure of our industry that we were not very helpful, broadly speaking, despite big promises in addressing COVID. Um, and the reasons for this, and I think this might be controversial with Jesper's talk, um, is that there are very minimal motivations, really, in the short term for doing reproducible, careful, validated science, right? In the sense that I need to get papers out, I need my grant application funded, I need my conference talk, I need to keep just practically progressing my science, I don't really have time to be like carefully benchmarking everything or making it a nice Docker package. Um, so my advice to you around there is, is apart from trying to take a slightly longer view for the reasons Jesper said, um, just be honest in what you're trying to do. If you're a scientist and you wanna be a data scientist, that's okay, write data science papers. But if you're trying to do genuinely push the limits of human knowledge, um, then maybe the best thing in this imperfect world is to try to use a few simple tools like put it on GitHub, make a run all Jupyter notebook, freeze your requirements, et cetera. There's some really low hanging fruit that, Jesper's, that Jesper went through and other people are going through shortly, like Gokyo, I think, um, that might help you get there. So that was a really quick um, run through of a few issues that I found in my work um, doing science with machine learning. And I think they might be relevant to people who are trying to build products, but also are ultimately trying to find the answers behind why the models work well, because that is, uh, in a practical sense, science. Thank you for listening. What a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. This, uh, it reminds me of the Andrew Eng paper where mm -hmm. they validated on the same x-ray uh, images as well, because patients get x-rayed multiple times. Yeah, I, it's, it's classic. Um, people get x-rayed multiple times. Also patients might present to multiple hospitals, right? You could imagine yeah. someone going from a community hospital as they get more ill being moved to like a major center and you can even have a, you know, a totally different ID, right? In your data, your approach data set. So yeah, difficult stuff to be aware of in the complicated non-Kaggle real world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, Kaggle has problems with that as well. There was this, um, there was the ice uh, challenge, the iceberg challenge, where you could simply uh, predict on the angle of the of the satellite and find uh -huh. those. Well, 
Thank you so much. Um, shall we take like a short break of three minutes and then go on with Goku? I'm so glad you made it. It's so early for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so we'll reconvene quarter past. Um, I'm sorry for robbing you of your of your longer break, but we kind of planned it that way, to be honest, <laughs> because delays happen. So enough time to get a get a coffee. If you if you want to have a chat, um, please do. And I'll just mute everyone in three minutes again.